What are you assimilating? What are we assimilating into? Right? Assimilating to a system of white supremacy. Why would you want to do that? It's a, it bothers my mind. It bothers my mind. And many of us trying to continue to assimilate into a system that don't want you in the first place. Never have, never will. Never have and never will. Why? Because they have. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. There's a, a psychological book, right? DSM, it's called, right? And in that book, they have one category of mental illness, right? Superiority complex. They say superiority complex is a mental illness. Stand with me. Superiority complex is a mental illness. So how does that correspond with or just position with my supremacy? How does it? Because white supremacy means that they are greater and better than anybody else on the planet. Is that true? Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I stand with correct. I ain't no problem with that. I'm standing correct. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Let you look at me. What you talking about? Yeah, yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. I've been swayed into a system of crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so what we have here is a worldview, a worldview. Right? That's dictated by a system of capitalism. Now let's go back. Let's go way, let's go further back. All right? Let's go to 1492. I just smile. You guys know what I'm talking about. I see that. You know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about right? 1492 Capital War. Right? By the Pope Frederick VI. Right? And that's how people got to look it up. Right? Go to your Google, your whatever, 1492, right? Capital Bull. And in 1492, the Capital Bull issued that the Portuguese and the Spanish could go around the world and talk to anyone who's not Christian. So identify them as being heathens, right? That's what they did. Right? That's the first point of the idea of imperialism. Colonialism and neocolonialism began to take hold as a not only a philosophy but a way of life. I say that, right? I say the system that we live in today is a way of life. Now let's bring it back a little bit more contemporary, right? In terms of this country that we live in. All right, so we got 1492, right? The 1492 established a popular goal that first created the conditions in which uh, a group of people had the belief system. But remember this coming out of the book, coming out of Christian uh, of philosophy or Catholic philosophy, right? That they have the inherited right to go and conquer other worlds, other peoples, right? To enslave other people. All right? Now here we are in the United States, 1776. And years later, right, we come up with an idea called manifest destiny. How does thing together? How to get now? Connect the dots. Here in the United States, we have an idea that we've been raised to believe is true, logical, rational, but it's a lie. Manifest that the United States manifest destiny to do what? And they have inherited the right to talk about the world, to oppress other peoples. Right? And then they build on that with the idea of what they call the Monroe Doctrine. Connect the dots. And this is what we are confronting today. This idea of manifest destiny, the United States and the world doctrine. And that's the reason why, that's the reason why I make the argument, foundational argument, that we have to decolonize our thinking. Decolonize our thinking, right? That we have to engage in programs like the People's Program. For the purpose of empowering our communities, the idea of separating ourselves from the existence of white supremacy in all of its manifestations. In all of its manifestations. So, what a manifestation, right? Don't get the minutes. 
Amen. Amen. 30th Amendment, 1865, right? 1865, right? Any child of slavery, right? The child of slavery said that you, as a person, treated by people, cannot hold other people as property. Right? That's what they said. But then that's been there an exception clause. Except for the community of the plan. And then what did they do behind that? They created the black codes, right? Created Jim Law, uh, Jim Crow Law. And other forms of means which you can usher people into this slave system, a new slave system. So they said that, okay, we cannot hold people's property, but the state can. The state holds people as property. Wait a minute, you know, you told me to say hold people as property. Hmm. Ruffin versus Tom Law. Look it up. Write it down. Check it out. Ruffin versus Tom Law. Right? Supreme Court Law. Still on the books. Still on precedent. And it states, that prisoners are slaves of the state. That's law. Now you cover that 13th Amendment, United States Supreme Court law, our prison state of the state. And then let's take two, let's take two, two, two for a day. Now, let's go, let's go here. <clears throat> School to prison pipeline. See how I trip back there? See how I got deluded? And I understand what's going on. Well, we're ushering our kids into a slave system. They created conditions to usher our kids into slavery. That's why they're going to get them. They continue to create new laws, new dynamics in which they can continue to contain and control our people, our population. Right? To continue to reinforce the idea of what? White supremacy. In all of its forms and manifestations. That is the gist of our struggle. That is the heart of our struggle. Right? To divorce ourselves from anything and everything that dehumanizes, diminish, devalues humanity of black, brown, and British people. If it does that, abolish it. Now, I'm in Rochester. Rochester is the home of. Frederick Douglass. There you go. Somebody holler. Frederick Douglass, right? The greatest abolitionist that we know about the two first time. Right? And so I identify myself as an abolitionist. I also identify myself as a revolutionary. I identify myself as Muslim. All right? Now, why do you identify myself as a revolutionary? The first step was revolutionary. It was abolition. All right? You take the word revolution. I want to say this to all you all, right? Who are here today. But I want all y'all to become revolutionary. Right? Take the word evolution, revolution, and take all of what word? Evolution. Right? So what does evolution mean for us as a people, right? As a human species on this planet. Right? We evolve. Right? In time, we evolve. Right? Given social economic conditions, environmental conditions. We as human species on this planet evolve. Sometimes it's necessary to put the art back on. Get it? You get it? Huh? So we all should be revolutionary. If we want to evolve from one state of existence to a higher state of existence, to a greater state of existence, right? Let's become evolutionary and when necessary, put the art back on. Right? Because they are extreme, they are extreme about keeping us oppressed. Dr. Martin Luther King stated that, um, I'm very afraid, right? There's no problem being an extremist, right? No problem being an extremist if you be an extremist for justice, for righteousness, right? So I'm an extremist. So I believe in justice and righteousness. And where I find that being crushed and diminished in any kind of capacity, I got something to say about it. You all should have something to say about that. Right? Okay, this is where we are today. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. I live in Rochester. I work for an organization called Citizen Action. It's a nonprofit, right? It does good work. Right? And I am a special coordinator, special project coordinator for Citizen Action. 
And one of the things I'm trying to do is halt the school to prison pipeline. Right? And I exhort you all, whatever capacity you possibly can, do that. Make that a priority to halt the school to prison pipeline. They're trying to close down private schools or public schools in this country. Right? Trying to privatize schools in this country. That's just why we find our schools being so tore up in our neighborhood. Right? And as a result, our kids, our babies being sent into the streets. And what happens when we get into the streets? We can't go out with criminal activities, right? For various reasons. And that ultimately, ultimately ushers them into the penal slave system. It's deliberate, it's intentional. They have takes that thing, I don't know if you want to that thing, we're talking about think tanks, right? That plan out these kind of dynamics, right? Essentially dictating how the world's going to be evolving, how the world's going to change or not change, for the benefit of seven hundred and forty people, or seven hundred forty families. What families are you talking about? You know? The billionaires that control the wealth of this country. Google it. Seven hundred and forty billionaires in this country has accumulated wealth of six point. Two trillion dollars, all the wealth of Western Europe. Here in the United States, 740 billion. All the wealth of Western Europe. And we are complicit. Complicit. A lot of that to happen. Right? And they control the wealth of this country. And we are fighting for what? The crumbs of this. Literally. Literally, and it happens to divide by class and race. Class and race. All right? You got 330 million people in this country, 740 controls $6.2 trillion. All right? And we fight over welfare and, and what? Pennies. Pennies. All right? What are we doing? We have to wake up. We have to open up our eyes and look at the reality of our situation. Right? As George said, what? People are dying. Oh, I'm saying, what is it again? Half a bunch of lives. Right? And we live in a state of fashion. Right? And it's becoming even more obvious. Right? We have already into a police state in this country. It's become more obvious. Right? They're killing us every day. We don't always hear about it. Every day, a black person, brown person, this person has been murdered by the state. Right? Or we've been ushered into the penal system, penal slave system. So I wrote a book called We All Liberated. I wrote this 21, 22 years ago, by a while in prison. For those who didn't argue 49 years. All right, when I was 19, didn't come out until I was 60. All right, 69. <laughs> 69, right? And all the time that I was in, I owned that. That's how I maintain my sanity. I tell people, say, they had my body in prison, they never had my mind and spirit. By law's decree, right? by God's decree, right? kept me sane. I right? kept me being involved and engaged and strong. Now, if I can do this out of attention, how come you can't do it out here? How come you can't contribute? How come you can't be a boss? Right? That's what this word. You can't say the word. How come you can't be a boss? How come? You can. You have to have the will to do so. The will, right? In the book, I talk about there's a chapter in the call. Commitment is the key. Commitment is the key. If you don't have, a, if you're not committed, as one might be to in a relationship, right? In order for a relationship to be maintained, you have to have some commitment. Is that correct? Right? Marriage, or partnership, whatever case it may be, right? You have to have a commitment. You got to be committed. Now we gotta be committed, we gotta be willing to do that work. Right? 
And it's a work of based upon the idea of what? Love. Love. Jacob Rell once stated that he said, he said, it might sound silly, but we say that the revolution is motivated by a strong sense of love. Of love. I love my people. Dearly. Dearly. I want to sacrifice my life for my people. Dearly. I tried. Well, I'm going to be honest. I tried to sacrifice my life. But dearly. Right? The front line is in prison. And while I was in prison, what I continue to do? Continue to love my people. I tend to give as much as I could to my people. Right? Because I understand the system of white supremacy that we engaged in. I understand the system of, of capitalism. Capitalism is based on two major persons, two major ideas. Uh, uh, the last is history. Right? Two major ideas. Individualism, competition. Two things. He said, also exploitation. <laughs> I get that. What is the opposite of individualism and competition? Huh? Unity and cooperation. So that's what we have to begin to believe as a method for us moving forward in raising up our own humanity. Because capitalism does not raise up our humanity. And denies it. Denies the capacity for which we can love one another. And what? In I mean, in revolution. I mean, in revolution. Stick with me. All right? The evolutionary process of where we begin to grow in our own self, in our own humanity, and evolve from the level for which we understand ourselves in terms of our needs and this society. Not only this society, but on the planet. The United States is engaged in warfare against black, black, brown, and people around the world. Around the world. We're complicit. Why are we complicit? Because we're silent. Our silence allows us to be complicit. Our silence makes us complicit. We're going to find it out. I was there, I did a webinar. I'm not going to begin. I, I, I skipped around a lot of places and tried to tie it all together. I did a webinar not long ago uh, with some comments on the international, international community. Like, I'm trying to build our relationship, relationship with the international community uh, in terms of those who are also fighting against the same system we're fighting against. Right? And I told them, I said, listen, if you want to understand the nature of our struggle, Build a new international, and you need to realize that your freedom is based upon our freedom. And I'm getting some hardcore stuff right now. Based upon our freedom. Why? Because we're in the belly of the beast. Belly of the beast. Right? So I gave an analogy of, of, of an octopus. Right? And said, so the octopus is got its tentacles all over the planet, sucking up the resources, sucking up the labor. Sucking up the wealth from different people around the world, primarily black, brown, and indigenous communities. Right? That's the period. Right? And, and sometimes those countries, right, get into engaging in colonial warfare or near colonial warfare, they cut off that tunnel. They cut it off, boom. They get free for a period of time. Right? And, I, and what happened in, in Chile, if anybody knows history of Chile, Salvador and India, right, and the social revolution in Chile. And it only took a matter of time before they were able to have a coup, right? As they almost tried to do here in the United States for the right wing, but some of them talk about. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and they put it in place this guy named Pinochet, a fascist. So now they engage on, again, we have to establish a new revolutionary determination, which is that's part of South America, and they are doing so, right? I got a webinar going to be in the 14th with some comments in Venezuela. All right, we'll talk about that internationally. All right. <clears throat> and so what we, what we come to understand is this here. If we don't cut off the head, then the world will continue to suffer. That occupants can grow with new tentacles, right? And continue to exploit other peoples in the world, other, other, uh, other people of color around the world. We continue to do so, bringing the profit. For who? Instead of 140 
Видимо, это чего плохо не скажешь? Сам вам взяли. А? А вы есть сауны? Да, и сауны. И говорите, а по нос, а что это с ним делать? Что это? Вот вот я не могу сказать, что это не А? Я не могу сказать, что это So I told them, say, listen, we support you all in your struggle. We have to go to like Palestine, right? Like Venezuela, like Cuba, like China, like Vietnam, like Korea, right? The other parts of the world, like Africa, South Africa, right? Mozambique, Tanzania, Momembe, 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 Angola, Guinea-Bissau, right? All the other countries that have fought against the United States, like Britain. The Portuguese, uh, uh, the Spanish, those who remember, who that 1492, don't come those, yeah. It's a long trajectory. It's a long history. Long history. But we've been engaged in the struggle. We're fighting, right? And why do they have not succeeded? Because we here as not so too much have the wrong will to fight back. We have periodic, pretty, periodic episodic struggles, which we engage in certain insurrections like Watts in Detroit, right? Uh, 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 here in Oakland, San Francisco, right? Riots and insurrections and so forth. We're fighting back. Police kills one of us. We get upset, go burn down the town, right? And they go back to business as usual. All right? They go clean it up, be a few jobs. And begin to pretend to oppress them. So I told them on the international, y'all got to support us. We're in the middle of the beast. Right? If you want to be free, you're not going to be free until black people are free. The world cannot be free until black people are free. I'll say it one more time. The world cannot be free until black people are free. Period. Period. There's no exception to that, understand? None. But we are in the belly of the beast. Right? And we're going to have the brunt, the brunt of the capacity for which they're going to try to continue to oppress people. Get ready. But they are. They are. What happened January 6th? That was black, brown, indigenous people stormed the uh, Congress at that time. Their bodies all over the Congressional Plaza. Is that right? Anybody deny that, uh, that possibility? That if we want to storm Congress, as they did on January 6th, you don't think they would blow us down? Why didn't they do that to them? Why? Come on now, talk to him. Because they believe in the same ideas of white supremacy. That's why. They may not have liked what they did, but it wasn't opposed to the idea of what they were doing. All right? What was they doing? They trying to nullify the black vote. That's what they're doing. And no for the black vote, this idea that black folks will liberate us. And no for the black vote, right? It's kind of about us. But we don't matter. Right? We don't matter. Black lives matter. That's part of the deal. We don't matter. So our vote don't matter. They try to nullify our vote. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's real. It's serious. Right? They have told us at that time that they're going to engage in the war to continue to maintain the idea of white supremacy. Now, this is not the first time that we have had this kind of competition in this country. When was the first time? Anybody know? Give me an idea. No, I heard, I heard. Well, somebody, somebody was something. What did they say? Civil war, yeah, civil war. Civil war. Civil war was a question about what to do about black people. What do you want? Some people want to keep, people, keep black people in slavery, challenge slavery. Others say, no, we can do something better. Right? 
maintain the union. What about two black people that will not keep, they had to do that in order to maintain the union. All right. So always the question, what to do about black people in the social order, we do brown people, red people, yellow people. All right. Keep that in your mind, keep that in your mind. Keep that understood, right? That everything is based upon the idea of white supremacy. And we keep saying this over and over again to me. Because it's, it's, it's part of our daily vocabulary. When you wake up, you say, white supremacy. Go back to that, white supremacy. We have to understand what our oppression comes from. It's not only just economic, right? It is this aberrant, this aberrant philosophy, this aberrant idea that's supported by a belief system that at least at minimum, you say started in 1492, right? And continues to evolve with the Monroe Doctrine or Manifest Destiny. Continues to evolve. Because right? they continue to evolve. This idea of knowing that they have to compete and knowing that they have to, that's what it's to be, knowing that they have to oppress or suppress the idea that white supremacy is an aberrant philosophy. When I say aberrant, I mean crazy. It's crazy. But any person, any group of people to believe that they are superior to any other people on the planet and act in that capacity, and act in that capacity, have the capacity to proper bomb, proper bomb, Talk about and say it's okay to do that. To annihilate people. Say it's okay to do that. The asset, the income, the charity. Right? It's okay to do that. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The whole cities. It's okay to do that. Right? What they did in Iraq, right? Kill a million people, a million people it's in, in two months. Talk about it. It's hard to do that. And we're silent. And the world's looking at us. They're waiting for us. They're waiting for us to liberate ourselves. To liberate ourselves. The part of the process, we have to decolonize our mind. We have to decolonize our thinking. Right? We have to come to recognize that we have been assimilated into a system that does not operate in our best interest. Come to that realization. Now, I said we've been traumatized, and we are. We are traumatized, and we are traumatized nation. Now, let me put this point also in terms of white people. They're also traumatized. How they come to that? And they believe in an in ideology and a philosophy that's patently false. They manifest in that ideology and that philosophy that's patently false. They live in a lie. That's how they come to that. Right? And it's our responsibility, it's our responsibility to tell them that. To tell them. Yo, white supremacy is a lie. And you believe that, then you are lying. Right? It's just God in nature. Why? Because in my book, God tells us that he made people in different cues, different hues, different colors, different tribes, so they get to know and learn from one another. Not have to enemy to hate from each other. I believe that. I hold that to be true. Right? Because when we do so, we all grow. We all evolve. We are better humans on this planet. They destroy the planet, people. Right? Y'all heard about global warming and et cetera. They destroy the people, destroy the planet. And they kill people, annihilate people, annihilate people, annihilate people. Without a bomb, without thought, without 
second thought for the purpose of profiteering. What the hell do they care about this planet? That's how aberrant the philosophy is. That is, in short, their own heritage. I mean that by their project, the future, generations to come. But oh, they're destroying the planet. That's why they're trying to find some place to go. Uh, another place to go. Mars, the moon, you know. <laughs> they're trying to find some place to go. And they know they destroyed this planet. And we are the only ones that have been saved. We are the only ones. Right? We only can say it. We have to decolonize our thinking. We have to decolonize our mind. We have to build programs, other people's programs across this country. Why is it building programs across this country? Because in, in doing so, we began to create a new methodology in which we began to empower ourselves for our own freedom, for our own liberation, for our own true independence, being independent of white supremacy. Be independent of a capitalist social order. So I ask the question Do you have the will? Right, remember what I said? You have to have the will. You have to have the will to do so. You have to believe that this is your destiny. All right? Individually and collectively. All right? Why individually and collectively? Why individually and collectively? Because we have a social system that depends upon you being individualized against one another. And in competition against one another. That's why we have problems with our struggles today. Right? It's difficult for us to build unity amongst the very progressive organizations. It's easy for us to sit in their own silos, their own systems, and their own ideas that I got the answer. So we don't cooperate with one another. And that's the result of been indoctrinated into a system based upon competition. We don't even realize it. So how much we have what? Assimilated. We internalize this idea. Internalize it. Sometimes not even know, realize it. Like that. So again, it's why we have to go in the process of decolonizing our mind, decolonizing ourselves. Decolonize our thinking. Huh? It's hard, it's difficult. That means that everything that you've learned from the time that you were said pledge allegiance to the corporation, I mean, not to America. That's Why did I say corporation? Oh, because 28 USC 3002, section 15, section 8 states the United States is a federal corporation. What? I'm pledging this to the corporation of the United States of America, United States of the corporation. Right? And so what we do. And they hide. The Constitution is the, the, the corporation's uh, 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 bylaws, the Constitution of the corporation. If you need anything about building a corporation, you have to have bylaws, you have the Constitution, you have to know how the corporation operates. That is the Constitution. That's the Constitution. That's the bylaws. That's why I think the amendment is what it is. Right? And other members of the Constitution. Right? Some of them may be successful, some of them may work with, some of them may not. More often than not, those who affect the benefit of black and brown indigenous people, they don't. Right? But in uh, 1877, I think it was, they brought the 14th Amendment. Oh, let's talk about the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment created conditions for which a person born in the United States will be, will be, will be uh, 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 become a citizen of the United States. Right? Why did they do that? Remember what I said earlier? Everything, most everything that goes on in this country, based upon what they could do about black people. What was the 14th Amendment was about? What to do about these black people? And so they imposed. A condition of citizenship, not not really. I mean, like second class citizenship. I mean, you know, citizenship of black people, Fourteenth Amendment, and black people never have opportunity to determine whether they want to be a citizen, or whether they want to go back to Africa, or whether they want to be standing on homeland, or whether they want to be citizens. No choice. It was imposed upon them. Listen, 
someone else's idea of what you, you should be or should not be. Like 14th Amendment. 15th Amendment was right to vote. Who they allowed the right to vote? Both of those black men, right? But you know, and the gate to vote now, I think we're going to in January 6th, right? We have to understand, we have to read these documents, this, 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 this constitution, and understand it in this historical context, how it came into existence. And you see, for the most part, it's for the benefit of white supremacy, not for us. All right, and so, <clears throat> Going. Going. And so, uh, let me just, I'm going to wrap this up, right? I was, I was 14, 92, 1861, 1865, 1877, 1968, oh, 1966. I was teaching a class in Indianapolis, uh, Black History class, right? And uh, it, was, it was approved class. And I started in 1861, right? And I raised this all the way up to uh, uh, 1966. And it was important we go to 1966 because what happened in 1966? October 1966. My grandpa party came to existence. All right? And it came out of the vacuum now. All right? My grandpa party that came out of it, it came out of the vacuum. It came out of the legacy of resistance in this country. A legacy of resistance, we're gonna talk about resistance now. A legacy of resistance. The resistance started way back, way back. Uh, let's just, let's just, let's for some point, let me truly understand, almost died, right? What happened to almost died, right? They overtook the ship, said we were free, right? Quincy Adams won the Africans their freedom. And then went back to, I think, the Ivory Coast, all right? Resistance or slave ships. Years of resistance on plantations across this country. And they don't teach us, all right? From who? Uh, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Bessie, the great Reverend Matt Turner, Harry Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer. Martha's Garden, really organizer that we know of. Right? He organized black people in the United States, Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and also in England. And just to give you some context of that, organized in 1920, I'm taking us all the way from 1920. When he was organizing UNIA, Right, the United Negro Improvement Association. He come under the scrutiny of a particular agent of the FBI by the name of J. Edgar Hoover. Right, and he focused on what Marcus Garvey was doing and could not find a way to undermine the work that he was doing except for infiltrating his organization. Right, and they could get a criminal uh, crime out of him. So they gave him a tax major crime. They put him in front of prison, and after they put him in front of prison in 1925, he was sent into exile. All right? Why is that important? Because in 1966, the Black Panther Party came into existence. They came up with an idea of calling Telpro to suppress the movement. All right? <clears throat> and Colin Telpro had some specific Goals and adjustments want, want to achieve. And I want to read them all. And I want to talk about them, right? And I'm going to go back to my story about me being the African. To prevent the coalition of military Black nationalist group and the effective coalition of Black nationalist group might be the first step toward a real Mama in America, beginning of a true Black revolution. Who's Mama? Anybody know? Yeah. Where was Mama? In Kenya, right? And they fought in Kenya and they liberated themselves from the British, right? They had the first black president, the first African president, they almost killed them down in Kenya. So, what are they trying to prevent from happening here? All right. To prevent the rise of a messiah, 
who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Not that that might have been such an aside. He was the model of the movement today. This idea of the Messiah evolved from his relationship or his struggle against Marcus Messiah God, who brought us one legacy that we hold on today, dearly. There's the what? Flag. Red, black, and green. That's our flag. Raise that flag. That is our history of existence in this country. All right? Let's go. To prevent violence on the part of black nationalist groups to counterintelligence, it should be possible to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them before they have to exercise their potential to fight. Hold up. Wait a minute. What are we talking about here? The word neutralize. Remember that said language is very important. That doesn't stand on language. Right? Language is important. Neutralize means what? To terminate, to annihilate, to kill, to end, to destroy. That's what happened to Fred Hampton. They neutralized him. They had the goal of just to kill, to neutralize, before you even engaged in violence, before you broke a crime. We understand that. And they did so. Many black men were murdered in the streets. In the streets, murdered. In the streets. Right? By selling the newspaper. Right? By establishing free breakfast programs. Right? By creating the ideas of that we need to have better health care. So we establish health centers in our communities. Right? The Black Panther Party was the one who created the idea of research for sickle cell anemia. That wasn't even on the map. But they want to neutralize that. All right? Destroy the party. So, I didn't finish the rest of it. Y'all can read it. <laughs> so, I'm going to put that one. I'm teaching this young boy. Right? I have Bloods, Crips, JD, right? Cancer Disciple, in the room, which case, all of these, right? And we kick it. I get to 1966. And what do they do? They close the program. I'm doing all of them, approved program. Oh, yeah, just like this. All right? You get to 1966, I'm talking about Black Panther Party. They go to the program, they put me in isolation for four months. What was the reason for? He said, You was trying to make these guys into revolutionaries. Huh? Oh, so you wanted to maintain the idea of being criminals, huh? Gangsters. So they go back in our community and kill our own people. They have a problem with that. No whatsoever. But you teach you to be liberated? To be emancipated, to be abolitionists, oh no, we're not having that. Yeah, they put them in the box. Four more months. We teach them the class. We're telling the truth. What I say about white supremacy, they're liars. Right? They're liars. Now the best most asked the question in the in, uh, presentation to uh 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 message grassroots. And he raised the question to nobody. Who taught you how to hate yourself? Who told you how to hate yourself? I'm not like that. Right? They make you understand to what degree you have been what? Assimilated into a system that dehumanizes your very existence. So I gotta go back to what? Decolonizing our mind. Let's go back to decolonizing our mind. We have to become what? What do we have to become? Oh, what do we have to become? Oh, Let's go home first. And nobody's going to liberate us but us. Can't expect white folks to do it, but they ain't. Can't expect white folks to do it. Uh, 
All right? You got to have the desire, the will to do so. All right? So that is the gist of this book. This book is a DIY. All right? It's a do it yourself manual. All right? Read the book. You take a study, a few people study, follow. Have you be surprised what's going to come if you have the will to do so? Right? Build your cadre. Find what are the needs of the people. That's what right now party did. Right? So from the masses to the masses. That's the principle. Right? Learn what the people need. That the Vice supremacist government that provided. Okay. So we have a system that is in corporation, right? Let me just add a caveat to that. And then I'm going to move on to what we did after I was in the Boston Hospital. The corporation, there's a case called Citizen Action or Citizen, Citizen United. Citizen United, Supreme Court decision. And in that decision, it stated that corporations are people. So I'm saying, corporations are people. So now when you read the preamble, the Declaration of Independence, and so forth, right? And they're talking about for the people, by the people, and all that rest of that bull crap they're talking about, right? And talking about since it in the day. We're not talking about fresh, flesh and blood in the day. Talking about corporations. All right? Person asked me a question about, uh, I wrote in the book, I got two things in, uh, two poems in the book. Uh, one about Baba Mania and uh, uh, Baba Nation, right? And of course, I asked why is why talk about Baba like that? Tell me why. <laughs> yeah. Tell me why. Because he's functioning in behalf of the corporation, for other corporations. Of corporation. So the government functions in the capacity as a corporation in the behalf of a corporation. That is their people. We are not. We are slave wage earners. We are slave wage earners. They profit off our land as they do around the world. Right? 740 billion. And we're complicit again by our side, by our do nothingness. All right, so understand that, right? Corporation of the United States function in the capacity of other corporations, and we're complicit because we continue to allow the corporation to function in the capacity of the people. All right? So I'm in a box <clears throat> and I wrote a proposal to my comrades in the industry. Uh, one by the name of Jihad Abdul-Mulet. He's the chairman of the Jericho Movement. Jericho Movement is an organization that I established back in 1998 uh, with my dear comrade Sophia Bukhari, Asif Bukhari, and Baba Bartram Ferguson. Uh, and I'm now deceased. Right. And Jericho been in existence since then. It's the premier organization that folks in the past that are talking about issues of food prisons in the United States. I tell my dad too. In the United States. So I sent my post to him. I said, listen, it's time for us to bring the international church back to the United States. We were brought back in, in, 18, in 1981 after I had organized one of the same and I established another program called uh, uh, another uh, campaign with the UN, UN petition campaign to the United Nations. The first time the petition for prisoners was heard in the United Nations in the book, right? There was the issues of political prisoners and what's the most harmful prisoners in the United States. And the international tourists came in and they told the United States, yes, we're not going to put the United States. All right. I think it said, I'll give you one before I continue. Let me just make this another uh, caveat. Uh, there's some comments here of mine. Um, uh, Merck and Rob, right? And also Leslie, um, who are part of my. In that UN campaign back then, right? They assisted in that development. They were at the time they for PFOC, certified organized organization, right? And um, 
They supported this mission back then. Back then. They've been supporters of the ever since. Stop, stop, revolutionary. So, the Robert Land International Jurors, they came in, they determined, they introduced the church in the right? And they determined that Blue Cruz exists in the United States. So, I had an opportunity at, at one point, I think my might have been working, came in opportunity, so they said, hey, we had a, a journalist in, in France uh, who could be uh, interviewing uh, at a press conference for the first black ambassador to the United Nations, a guy by the name of Andrew Young. And they asked me, they said, well, is there any questions you want to ask Andrew Young? I said, yeah, one question, one question only. I said, there's political questions that exist in the United States. That's the only question I wanted to ask, right? The journalist asked the question, and I really know the answer. Yes, perhaps thousands. And for, for, for answering that question, truthfully, he was called to the White House under the president to see how far Jim Carter, right? And he told me, shut that down. Shut that down, right? Google it, right? Andrew Young, political Christmas, right? United Nations, you guys, friends, don't come up. It was all in New York Times, but they, they, they were after him. And then he said something in support of Palestine. That's when they kicked him out of the office. They said, don't you turn on. You got to go. All right? Because he's opposing, he opposes Zionism. Like another form of terrorism, right? racist and terrorism. All right, so <clears throat> middle box. I said this this falls out to my comrade. I said, man, we need to bring the international jurors back. All right. Uh, because we need to let's break the idea of the political push in the United States. We need to continue to strengthen our struggle that capacity. All right. And so they came to uh they to uh sent to our uh, genetic uh, lip. He brought to another one of my comrades, they called Dinga, right? The BLA, uh, person, right? And brought to another comrade, a guy by the name Matt Myers, who had really extensive uh, contact in the international community. And then he said, No, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to build this out, Jamil. We're going to turn this thing into issues of genocide. What? Fine. Fine with you. Right? That's what we did. Right? We wrote a petition, we wrote a petition to the international community, said the United States is engaged in the process of genocide. All right. October 2021, we had the International Tribunal and Malcolm X Benny Shabazz Memorial Center in Harlem. The Memorial Center is the place where Malcolm was murdered. It was used to call the Audubon Mall, right? Perfect place to hold this tribunal. It's not a tribunal, right? And international jurors come in. This is this, this, this no international jurors. People are known around the world doing human rights work. Establishing themselves with the first international organization, NGO, including the United Nations. And they sat and they listened to 30 witnesses and boxed the documents to review. And they determined, after our artist to them, the United States is found guilty of genocide. It's black, brown, and indigenous people. It's just a mass incarceration. It's your police killing. It's your public health inequities. Issues of environmental racism and the issues of gun repression. All right. Five charges. United States of Prime Minister on five charges. There's a White House on it. I don't even say Black House, there's a White House. The news ain't touching it. All right. The first time in history, the United States has been found guilty of the charge of genocide by a esteemed body of international jurors. It's historic. Why is it historic? Because in December 17, 1951, the great Paul Robeson, so we may have heard of the great W. D. Du Bois, some of you may have heard of him. The great William Patterson fought the first charge of recharge genocide. That was December 17th, 1951, about two months after I was born. All right. The FBI prevented Paul Robeson from going to Geneva, Switzerland, to argue the petition. 
William Patterson was in, he made it over there, received the petition. They tried not to bring him to have him come back to the United States. Bring the charge of genocide against the United States. We successfully, on October 25th, 9th, 2021, had a decision, a verdict, that the United States was found guilty of genocide. Historically. Let's talk about that. But now we not only deal with the issue of, 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 of corporate entity or white supremacy, deal with the entire fabric and practices that they've been doing for black people, brown people in this country for 400 years. Genocide. We suffer genocide. And you want to continue to assimilate the system and continue to practice the idea of genocide against us? Just, just keep just keep just an idea, right? This, some of us don't even know what genocide means. What does that mean? Genocide? What's a genocide? How do you spell it? Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Back before the Convention of Genocide states. Convention of Genocide means any and all the acts are committed to attempt to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as killing members of the group. Maybe killing us. Somebody denying that? Maybe killing us, right? Causing serious body or mental harm to members of the group. We've been traumatized. What we did. Deliberate inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. I'm sorry, I'm going to say this here. White people live twice as long as black people in this country. Why is that? How, how does that come to be? In whole or in part, destroying black people. In the last 50 years, black people population in this country has not reached around 13% of the population. From 11 to 13 percent in the last 50 years. We ain't even grown as a population of people on, on, in this social order. In the 3,000 by 2,000 miles of what we call the United States, it actually the room of Trevor Island. I don't know, don't, don't know, like indigenous. All right. What happened? I see signals. Good. All right. <laughs> I got first row fishing going. <laughs> wow. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Sterilization. Sterilized women, black women, indigenous women, Puerto Ricans. They got a case going on down in Chichilla uh, prison right now about sterilizing prisoners without their consent. They had 20 years ago, a big struggle in Puerto Rico. We're sterilizing uh, uh, a Puerto Rican women, right? In numbers, preventing their births. By forcing them transferring children of the group to another group. We know they did this with indigenous people. Indigenous people. Saw the babies, Native American babies, gave the missionaries, paid them off the missionaries, cut their hair, changed their name. Took away their culture. Today, go look at the foster care system. How many black and brown babies in the foster care system today? Why is that? What happened to those families? In whole or in part? Yeah, they're guilty. We can press it by our silence. Oh, wait a minute. You can do something about like that. The following are punishable or shall be punishable. Genocide. Conspiracy to commit genocide. Direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Attempt to commit genocide. And complicity in genocide. Oh, wait a minute. Right, let's, let's take a look at the United States, 18 U.S.C. 1091. Ooh, informs you that the United States and owners books of genocide to be against genocide. Right? That's the treaty to the 1948 convention. All right? Let's treat the United States convention. Genocide. It's on the United States books. It's in the federal records. It's in the federal court. And they're supposed to do this. 
All right? And what we're going to do, we're going to file a lawsuit based upon the verdict, the international insurance verdict, that the United States has been found guilty of genocide because black brown groups will file a lawsuit on that. And we're going to charge the United States for failing to follow the law. So we know they ain't going to charge themselves for committing genocide. They're not. But we're going to use this as an organizing tool to raise the question, raise the issue, very similarly to how uh, uh, civil rights movement was uh, uh, cancer versus Tico, uh, uh, Tico Canada, by the Board of Education versus Tico Canada, by that broke open, election broke open, the idea of segregation of the school system. That created a whole movement behind that. That's how we're going to use this case moving forward, right? Follow this lawsuit and use it as a tool which to educate people how the United States has been complicit, at the minimum complicit, in the form of genocide. That's what I'm moving forward. And the process of doing that, we will begin the process, we will begin to build what we call a people senate. I'm tired of living in the system of genocide. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm not fighting the work. And you know, when I was 19 years old, when I was engaged in the struggle of obligation, right? Uh, just jump back just a little bit, right? Black right Panther Party had rule number six. That no Black Panther Party member can join any underground organization except for the Black Liberation Army, rule number six. So when the Black Panther Party came into existence, right, they already knew that at some point in time we had to engage in home struggle. So we had to fight back. I already talked about the history of resistance in this country, right? So the legacy of the Black Panther Party at that point in time came from the idea of home struggle, came from that idea of resistance, right? It came from the idea of Robert Williams and his book. Negroes with guns. It came from the idea of the African Black Brotherhood, right? On revolution, Black Revolution fought against the plan. It came from the idea of victims for defense, right? Who were armed ministers and pastors who protected the civil rights movement. It came from the idea of us fighting back in these riots that went on, these insurrections that went on throughout the 60s and the 70s. That we have to have the capacity to defend ourselves and defend our community. And that's what we did as young people back then. Right? And that's why they came up with the Tail Code to destroy that movement. Keep in mind the Black Panther Party was a youth movement. There was no one at the end, at the initial organized the Black Panther Party was over the age of 30. It was 30 years and younger, teens, 20s. They believe in our people, they love our people, they just want to sacrifice their lives for our people. We fought hard, fought hard. Many of us sacrificed our lives, so we were in exile, like our brother and sister, our son Shakur, our sister C, Charlotte, or while we, and like I said, we have a, 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 a webinar uh, with the business women comrades. Sister C is going to be on that webinar with us. She and I can count. All right? Yeah. We have to resist. We have to resist the genocide. Killing us. And it's deliberate and it's intentional. And now we have recorded that the international community have come to agree with us, right? Based upon the history, based upon the, the wealth of information that's presented to them, undeniably, that the nation has been engaged in genocide with black, brown, indigenous people, and it's time for us to put it in. Period. I'm done. Not for me. All right? Seven years old. I'm seven. I've been fighting for all the years. But I'm seven years old. And then this is really good with that one more, one more point. Just no point. Right? I just lost my mom last month. Right? Terrible, terrible, terrible loss for me. Terrible loss for my family. Right? I got a whole idea. I'll never be filled. There's a vacuum here. Never be filled. My mom was a giant in the community. Right? My mom was a dancer, uh, young dancer, African dance. Right? Uh, and she's come home and she's African dance to me and my sister. Right? We used to do that. Right? African dance. We used to do it. And one thing she said in terms of why I've been African dance, she tells me, listen. 
You're not a Negro. You're not an N word. You're not a coon. You're an African. You're African descent. Right? African descent. That was my identity growing up. Right? We have to have grasp our identity. Hold on to that. We are African descent. Right? My grandfather and the, and the bottom guns family came with the idea of Kwanzaa. When Kwanzaa came up, we made part of the African tradition of our family. Kwanzaa. Right? It's part of our breed. You know what I'm That's why that's what I did. That's what I did. Right? Yeah. It's in our breed. It's in our family. We got to hold on to that tradition the best we possibly can and pass it on to our children. That's what I'm saying. You don't fight for me anymore. I fight for the babies, the next generation. Right? This struggle is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We've been engaged in this struggle for 400 years. When I say, I'm going to stop, we ain't stop. All right? Time it all together. We ain't stop. But now we come to an idea, now we come to a conclusion. The conclusion is this this country is engaged in genocide. Right? And the world, the international community is waiting on us to get busy, to end this system of carnage that's been going on for 400 years around the world, from the time of the Aztecs and the Incas, to the enslavement of the Africans, to the sterilization of Puerto Rican women, to the annihilation of Native Americans. Let me just add one more point to that. Uh, my great grandma, my great grandma, she's the most geeky creep out of Alabama. My grandfather, a moon. I'll tell you a story, family story. Uh, right before, I got some stories. <laughs> right before, right before I uh, was uh, blown from uh, the same point. My grandma came to see me, right? Came with, with her son, my uncle Joe, right? And uh, she said, listen, what, for the last time I'm gonna see you, right, because you ain't going to New York, and I know I ain't gonna see you again. I need to tell you why you are the way that you are. I live my uncle's, I'm not talking about it. She's gonna tell you why I am the way I am. She said to me, Uncle Joe told me, said, before I miss his grandma. <laughs> And so she told me about the story of my, my grandfather, my great grandfather. How he came to Georgia, he got into trouble. Right? And then on the Indian Trail, the Trail of the Indian Trail, he met his wife in Alabama. He got in trouble. Right? Then he moved to Louisiana, right? And he established his home there in Louisiana. And when my grandma told me that your, your great grandfather was in trouble, the implication was, okay, I know what you're talking about. I know what time it was in them days. Huh? So you didn't have to explain any more further than that. And when we got to uh, Louisiana to change his name. So I have nothing. I'm at the bottom. I changed my name to the bottom. That's how I said I'm at the name. Bottom. All right? So she said, listen, here you are, going around this country, getting into trouble, and changing your name. <laughs> it's just like your great grandfather. OK, I'll do that. I accept that. All right. That's my story. That's my story. All right. And so for me, for us, I think it's time for us to begin the process of decolonizing our minds, decolonizing our thinking, right? Understand the history of this country. It has never been, it will never be, never be a country working in behalf of black, brown, and indigenous people. It will not. It works in the best interest of white supremacy. Have and we continue to do so for as long as we live, as long as we are silent, they will continue. That's all. Right. Thank you. Thank Thank <laughs> you.
so loud. So we can. All right, I'm gonna try it. Uh, we're gonna do a little panel uh, discussion and hopefully I'll make some questions and answers. All right, the question we have two minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I think we already held the mic. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I'll say me, me or B's on. It's a good. My speech. Q&A, so people could take a seat. 
We're going to get started again. We're going to get started again. Ready? 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 You ready to go? You ready to leave? You ready to leave? <coughs> So, that was <coughs> <coughs> All right, we can take a seat. I'm about to get started. Like, if this was a different type of crowd, you feel me? Like, I feel like I was getting a pregame speech. Nah, it was there. It was there. Yeah. I just heard that. I know nothing. I'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when I say free the people, y'all say free the land. Free the people. Uh, so we're here, y'all kind of have, uh, I don't know we got three mics up here, but can we keep it down? One mic, please. Appreciate it. So we're here in, uh, like August, a very significant month, a very significant time period where we're studying, fasting, fighting, and training as an organization to come into uh, evolve ourselves uh, and become stronger, revolutionary, stronger organizers. Uh, so my question is, What's the importance of Black August? Uh, what's your connection to this month? And, and again, if you could just talk about like, the, the significance uh, of Black August, Comrade George and his comrades who, who made uh, ultimate sacrifice for us to be here in this room. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Black August was created by Black August. Black August was created by. Uh, prisoners and California prison system uh, back in 1978. Uh, what happened was in August 7, 1970, brothers Button I have here, Jonathan Jackson, 17 year old, man brother, child, man child uh, the brother of George Lester Jackson, made a heroic move to try to free his brother. He went into Marin County Courthouse with weapons to free two other revolutionaries by the name of William Christmas and William McLean. He took over the courtroom, and another individual was there fighting for his own case. They asked him, You want to come? His name is Rochelle McGee. Rochelle McGee is the longest held political prison in the country today, right? <clears throat> As they leave the courthouse, uh, the California Department of Corrections <laughs> and other law enforcement decided to barrage uh, the band that they were in and killed everyone. Everyone except for Rochelle. Rochelle survived. Right? Rochelle went to court and he was found not guilty of killing the judge. They hid that decision by the court. By the, by the jury. He's in prison today, today, for a crime that he has been found not guilty of. This is not unusual with the United States court system. We have other people who's in prison, innocent, right? <clears throat> a year later, October, I mean, August 21st, 1971, his brother, George Lester Jackson, allegedly attempted to escape from San Quentin prison and he was murdered, he was killed, right? Very dubious issues will happen with that case. Right? We have really haven't found out the real, what happened in that case. 1978, brother by the name of Jeffrey 
Kutari Golden. Golden. G A U L D E N. Golden. Was playing some uh, uh, football in a little small yard in just the center of St. Quentin Prison. He fell in his head on concrete, cracked his skull, and let him bleed out. And he died. He had inherited the, uh, the leadership of the Black Guerrilla family. Right? Uh, was the Black Guerrilla family? Black Guerrilla family were Black prisoners who found the necessity to come together to defend themselves from being murdered by the Aryan Brotherhood, neo Nazis, the prison guards, right? In California prison system. They've been killed, being murdered. I told you, genocide. Well, they kill us. Yes, they do kill us. Right? <clears throat> and so they decided to come together, black group family, and honor Jonathan, George, and Gutari. And when they did so, they started looking at history and finding that other resistance was happening in the same month of August. Other noted issues happened for the same with the office, right? Like that terrorist rebellion was long, right? Like uh, the birthday of uh, Marcus Messiah Garden was long. Like the revolution of Haiti initiated in office. And so they began to evolve a understanding that this would be a good month for us to celebrate or to at least acknowledge and honor those who were resistant, our resistance, right? And we came to the idea of Black Arms. Black Arms has been going on for now almost 50 years. Almost 50 years now for these brothers in the prison. And so we initiate, when we support and engage in the practice of Black Arms, fasting, right, studying, exercising, and Basically, testing our wherewithal, our self discipline, to discipline ourselves and reground ourselves in the understanding of our struggle. That's Black Arm. What's the uh, importance of having self discipline as a, someone who's trying or uh, trying to be a revolutionary or with the goals of being a revolutionary? What's the importance of self discipline? Natural, natural self discipline allows you to strengthen your, your moral character and your, your moral foundation, plus your political beliefs. Of which you actually believe it, right? It serves to where you check yourself when you wreck yourself, right? Yeah. It allows you to really go in deep and find out, you know, what is the your real method, you know? Uh, if for those of us who are Muslim, we fast for the month of Ramadan. And for many of us, especially in hot months, ooh, it's hard. It's hard to go without water and food for, you know, from sun up to sun down. And so uh, they decided that you do this for the month of August, uh, taking some any sort of person from the, the month of Ramadan and uh, add it to the political context of our struggle. And uh, yeah, self discipline is extremely important. It allows you to really get into inside yourself and see what is your strength and what is your weakness, right? When you find your strength, build upon it, when you find your weaknesses, try to change it. We heard you talk about uh, Frolin uh, throughout the speech of who, who break down Frolin for the people, what sure. it is and why it's important to the new African principle. Absolutely. Frolin um, means front for the liberation of the new African nation. Right? I took the, the name from another movement uh, in Africa during the late 60s and 70s. Right? Frolin Front for the liberation of Mozambique. Right? <clears throat> and that's where the name, the, the origin of the name comes from, the mind thing. Right? And the idea that, yes, I believe that we, as people in this country, need to be liberated, need to establish our own nation in this country. <clears throat> Why I say that? Because the country is consistent of other nations. Right? There are sovereign nations already existing in the United States. Sovereign nations. Right? Native, native sovereign nations. They exist in the United States. But because of white supremacy, they're not able to really enjoy the idea of them being independent sovereign nations. 
Let us understand that. Right? Second of all, I just talked about the 14th Amendment. Right? We never had an opportunity to have what is called a plebiscite. A plebiscite vote. A plebiscite vote gives a people who will have been liberated the opportunity to determine whether or not they want to become part of that nation. Right? Develop their own nation. Right? Develop their own nationality. Right? The U.S. Declaration of Human Rights states that every person, let me see if I can find it here, it's in the book. It says here, everyone has the right to a nationality and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality or denied the right to change his nationality. No one. That's what I should do. I got a human right to identify myself as a new African. I denounce the idea of that I'm American just because I'm born here. Right? I denounce the of these two corporations. Period. All right? And so, 1968, there was an organization uh, called Republican New Africa. Well, there was a group of individuals uh, in Detroit, 500. Reverend Internationalist in Detroit had a meeting at the uh, uh, church of uh, Reverend Franklin. Who's Reverend Franklin? Reverend Franklin is the daddy of Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin's daddy was Garveyite. He supported the ideas of Garvey. So they had a meeting at this church and it was raided. A 15 year old guy by the name of Mutulu Shakur was there at that time. And it is known that he saved a couple of people when that place was raided by the cops. Right? And the purpose of that meeting was to establish what he called the provisional government of New Africa, New Africa, 1968. Uh, some of the people wanted to go to prison, uh, and others wanted to exile, and uh, others got away, you know, there is no time and so forth. Okay. And so the provisional government of New Africa continues to be a Formation in the United States. Unfortunately, it's not, in my opinion, organizing itself as it could be. Right? And I thought that perhaps we need to build something as uh, a supplement. Right? You know, some of supplements, you take your vitamins, you take each food, they take vitamins and supplement. So I'm thinking about creating, folding out, front of the of the nation as that supplement. As an organization, and you'll find it in the book. The book talks about the four and nine from the University of the Nation, and it gives you a whole new program, uh, decolonization program, a uh, three phase theory for our national independence. Right, you gotta have a theory if you're a revolutionary theory in order to build a revolutionary movement, right? And we have not had a solid revolutionary theory here in the United States, right? In my thinking, and so therefore, I created what I want to call three phase theory for national independence, right? And start falling up. And also, how we're going to build for it now. Right? I said, well, first of all, we have to decolonize our thinking. Right? And in that instance, I said, let's build decolonization program. Where do you decolonization program come from? Came from the Black Panther Party. Black Panther Party had a program called Survival Programs Pending Revolution. Right? The human movement, Bobby Seals, and put together. Right? <clears throat> so, Understanding that, there's a problem in my thinking about that, right? It's says pending revolution. Survival programs, pending revolution. I understand the meaning of it, but I think the language is important. So I said, well, let's do this. Let's develop decolonization programs, rather than for survival programs, to decolonize ourselves and empower our community. That's revolution. All right? So we ain't pending revolution, we're building the revolution. I developed these decolonization programs. And we have decolonization programs across the country. And we're going to link them together as a network of decolonization programs. All right? That's going to be the first step of finding the foundation of the Front for Liberation of the Nation. You've spoken about uh, discipline, about will. Uh, we are all liberated as a section. Commitment is key. Uh, for those of us who are involved in a revolutionary organizing. Uh, what makes a strong cadre and a strong cadre women? Uh, commitment. 
right? The study. You gotta have a study group. That study group has to be able to do three things. Engage in three principles, right? Criticism, self-criticism. Criticism, self-criticism. You have to be honest with yourself about your own weaknesses or failures or how your personality will sway you one way or another in your own personal interest rather than the interest of your community, the interest of your cadre, the interest of your organization, right? Criticism and self-criticism is extremely important. Principle to apply. Second of all, combat liberalism. Cannot be liberal with organizational structure, right? You have to be brutally honest with yourself and the movement itself, right? Combat liberalism. And the third one is the correct handling of contradictions. Okay. So, commitment is a key. And have commitment to do those three things, right? Be brutally honest with your criticism of yourself and of your comrade. And when you, when you criticize your comrade, you, you present this criticism as if it was a gift, as if it was a present. Right? My dear brother, my dear sister, right? I need you to look at this because it may have some ill consequences. It may have some ramifications uh, 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 not considered. Right? Inconsequential uh, uh, ramifications, right? That maybe have a negative impact on what we're trying to achieve. Right? Look at these things, uh, consider these things, right? Present your criticism as if it was a gift, as if it was a person, that you're honoring that person. The person, not what they're doing, but the person, right? And the correct kind of contradiction. We're going to have contradictions throughout the struggle from beginning to end. There's going to be contradictions. Why? Because we're building something new with something old. Right? We're trying to get rid of something old. That means we're trying to rid ourselves, um, uh, that's what I'm trying to do, expunge from ourselves bad behavior, bad ideas. Right? And in so doing, you have conflict with one another on issues, right? Disagreements and understanding. Of what's going on in the struggle or amongst yourself or with yourself, right? These are contradictions. Contradictions are dialectics, right? When I say dialectics, it's unity and struggle of opposites. If everything is unity and struggle of opposites, this is how the world comes to be, right? Unity and struggle of opposites. Unity and struggle of opposites is like taking a magnet, a magnet, you have a negative polarization and a positive polarization into one thing, right? So you got to know which ones, what is the hit, the other two, two negative together, they're repelled against each other, right? Put a negative and positive together, they're together, right? Those are the understanding of these contradictions, right? Correct having those contradictions will lead to a better result. So uh, commitment is key uh, in forms of that. You got to have the commitment to engage in those kind of practices, right? In order to build a strong, doable, Relationship, right? Build a relationship, cadre. Somebody from Pelican Bay. Huh? Somebody from Pelican Bay. Pelican Bay? Yeah, what is this? Yes, brother. Yeah, I hear you. Who am I speaking to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is JD. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, how can we get customer thinkers to organize the Question. Anybody hear a question? Yeah. All right. All right. 
He's asking, he's asking, how can we build a movement to support the brothers of man the agent and, and the public bank hunger strike and other strikes, hunger strikes in, in the prison system and build a movement to help these brothers uh, get out of solitary confinement and other forms of pressure that they, they confront the inside the prison system. <clears throat> One thing is important, brother, and I'm saying this for those brothers who do get out of prison, right? They need to get involved in the struggle, right? Uh, many of those brothers, some of those brothers, I think, maybe some of the brothers who are in the hunger strike, when they got out, some of them did get out, they did not engage in the struggle. They did not build a movement or build a, uh, an organization that would support the brothers on the inside. That's one. So we have to ensure that we have the discipline of our comrades who are coming out to our prison. Two, uh, it's important that you guys consistently present information to the political organizations that you have an affiliation with here in California. I don't live in California anymore, so I don't know all the ins and outs of California about uh, uh, prison support movement, right? But we need to have continuous communications with them as best as possible we can, right? Uh, and natural, because communication, communication is, is another key, right? Before understanding. If you're not able to communicate uh, with people uh, by forms of um, letters, uh, articles, uh, proposals, et cetera, then no one, no one would understand what's going on. One thing I would suggest that the ones here uh, in uh, California with the prison do. What we did back in, in the 70s, we started a newspaper, right? A prisoner's newspaper. And uh, we had time for us to give the prisoners to, to, to contribute to that newspaper. Uh, we had what's called the prison called the papers on the spirit that had been done back then on the spirit, right? We developed a new, uh, another uh, newspaper or a newsletter by some of our comrades in that prison to make sure that every Support group, this is support group in the community, is a copy of that and distribute it into, into the community as far as wide as possible can. Communication is important. If people don't know the struggle, then they know where the problem can come from. So we got to keep people informed of what's going on, right? But even as important, and I say this over again, when brothers come out, they got to get engaged. They can't go to different places, different things, and not be involved anymore. Um, and naturally, uh, I'm fighting lawsuits. Build on the basis of the lawsuits, right? Uh, use, use the law as, as a tool, right? But more importantly, and, and more thing that I can say over and over again, promote your struggle by any means that you possibly can, right? Make sure the, brother, make sure the people in the streets know what's, what's going on inside. Right? If you have to come as outside, then make them be your spokesperson. Make them be your representative on the outside. Right, so they can go step to these individual organizations and ensure that your word is being heard. Right, let's deal with Jericho. Okay, we're going to put the prisons. Right, uh, when I had Sophia Bukhari, uh, Sophia Bukhari, who was a staunch revolutionary, she's traveling state to state, state uh, and speaking the name of the prisons in California. You all need to have, have the same thing. You got to have an outside representative. Who has the authority to speak to what's going on on the inside? Right? And you also need to have your words, your words also told. That's why I say, you do. Get your newsletter. Put together a newsletter. Get your put together a newsletter and uh, have your words being put out there and promoted uh, in an organized form. I hope that was helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Matter of fact, I think we put it, we also have a newsletter, John Black's newsletter as well. And we put your information in our newsletter. This is an online newsletter, and we put your information in our online newsletter. But is there anything more substantial than that you need to do? That you need to do? Go to, go, make sure you bring the information to the chairman of Jericho, Jihad Abdul Mubek. Oh, sorry. We got uh, one question from the Zoom, and then we can pass it to the crowd. Uh, this person says, we are on Liberators does an incredible job outlining the decolonization programs we need to go organize. How, though, do we start a revolutionary cadre among our communities today? Study, start a, a book study. So start there, right? We got to have everybody on the same page. Right? Everybody on the same page. 
It started as uh, a book study group, right? And you have, you have a group of people uh, who are studying the same material, then you have group think. Group think. And you organize on the basis of group think. Then you find out what is the need in your community, and you go try to alleviate that need. That's important. All right? So uh, that's, that's the first process. And then when you do start doing that, that group think will turn into a cadre, right? People will think alike, do the same work. All right, let's organize. Questions from the crowd? I'll bring the mic to you. Oh, y'all got questions. Oh, Miss Garber. All right, brother. I'm going to bring your mic on to you. For the people in the room, this notion of Waging revolution. Um, there's a notion that resources are very important to people. So I'm going to go back to uh, 1969. But this how you organize. You need resources. So if people got resources, please kick in because there are people in jail who been there since the late 60s, the early 70s, and there are people in this country who are actually supporting this, supporting these people that they send them resources. Um, I feel down here, help the people here. People in the program, help that process. If you can, if you cannot support it in any way, Thank you, thank you, brother. I, I really appreciate that. Yes, we we have not only each of each one teach one, but each one to to provide some kind of service, right? Find out what you can what you can do, right? Wherever you, get in where you fit in, right? Each one teach one, get in where you fit in, right? Uh, the sacrifices can be made for those individuals who have capable of sacrificing a little bit more. Do so, right? Because you sacrifice it in your own behalf. They have to the future. They have to the next generation. Like, like I said, this movement is not a split. It is a marathon. It goes from generation to generation. Right? And so we have to cultivate those individuals who are prepared to take the baton that is ready to be passed to them. Right? Keep the struggle going forward. Yeah, So I'm like, one of the things <clears throat> I've had the honor to work with these young success mentors for a while. And, uh, you know, you're the age, you know, you, you, you're a true elder in my, in my eyes and everybody else's eyes. It's kind of, it's kind of me, not still up right. Not trying to be like you when I get on. You still scared to talk. You should have seen him in the heavy bag earlier really before. And I can see his form until he hit that <laughs> uh, What I want you to speak to, though, is like the importance of intergenerational building, right? Because oftentimes what I see, which is, it seems like came through the brother's call as, as, as a lot of play, is there's this divide, right? How do we get the elders to do this? And we may have heard the elders on the other side, but like, well, how do we get the youngsters to do this? Did you? A part of the problems that we have, we actually have communities. Communities are intergenerational, but they're actually functioning properly. And oftentimes people seem to silo themselves into community based on peer group. When movement for community building is based on everybody. So can you speak to the importance of I may mention, I may mention that in my, in my presentation. Um the capital social order creates the mindset of individualism. Competition. Right? We still have to decolonize ourselves. We have to get that, we have to internalize it to the extent we have to simulate that into our, our DNA, right? We have to do this in the state, right? And so we have to figure out ways how to get that out of our system to build more cooperation, right? And unity. Cooperation and unity is the option of individualism and competition, okay? And so uh, we have to have the will to do so. Uh, 
generational. For old heads, right? It's hard to talk to these young boys or these young women, right? These young people, right? Because they ain't trying to hear what the old heads are talking about, especially they ain't doing nothing. They're just talking, okay? So you do by example. By example, don't talk about it, be about it. Okay? Let them see what you're doing, say what you're saying. And if they're doing the work, the young people are going to look at that as a yo. My pops do the work. You know what I'm saying? You know, and they're going to be recruited. You bring them in. Right? Because these young kids, they ain't stupid. Right? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Right? Okay. Uh, I was just a young so I know what they used to do. Okay. And so it's important for us to show them by example. Just ain't going to treat those young people too, right? If you ain't got no pamphlet, you ain't got no leaflet, you ain't got no program, ain't tell you what you're talking about, right? And I have to respect that. Because you ain't talking about you. Uh, if they talk loud and say nothing, as Jamie Brown used to say, you can't do nothing like that. But talk loud and say nothing. You have a bad sense. You know what I'm saying, bro? So, yeah, show my example, right? And if you do that, they respect it. That's correct. Right. Yeah, yeah, brother, back there. I see you. Hey, 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 I am, I am. Oh, G, real quick. Yeah, I am. On that, I'm going to come to stay. I recently got, you know, I got a last last year. This year, what we did for home strikes, you know, AB, Nazi, Eskimo, we all got together. I did 20 years in the home. But what I believe, what I think, how I think, yeah. right? Like you said, we took it to court. Yeah. That's how we got out. That's right. Because it's, uh, we like that we're still in court. They still thought. Sure, no. This brother, this brother, this brother, we all was in the home together. Right. You no. Know, uh, when I came home, I started an organization called uh, Giving Back. Okay. The farming cost me Giving Back. I've been putting in a lot of work, you know. Beautiful thing. Get a brother hand, man. Yes. You know, that brother been down about 40 years. Okay. And I did like 25 or 10. All right. First 20 in the home. Right. You know, we went to court and we won. You know, four brothers about to die from the phone. This is the shoot. Yes. This is the shoot. Yeah. This is not the like you say, BGF. Yeah. You know, BGF, Nazi, Nancy Mountain, Mr. Flamingo. You know, we all came together. Right. Before that, we lost our kids. Yeah. I know that. I'm saying. You know, we're trying to kill each other every day. I know. Through the cell. We're treating everybody each other. We're going to make fun of each other. We're doing all that. Yeah. Then we can be getting together. I mean, why are we trying to kill each other? Yeah. You know, right. we're not real enemies. One of the head, uh, not low rise, is my name from there. Yeah. You know? And it was cool. Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, he see what he was, like you said, corrupt thinking. You know? He realized that. Yeah. We couldn't come out of jail and we all got together. See, look, we know we're real enemies. We have no power back here, but we have the power to do to do the right thing. Right. That's what we did. We came together. Right. We can do the same thing out here. You know, on the speech. I, I, mean, I ask I ask you to do this, my, 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 my comrade. I ask you to tie your organization with other organizations. We right? can do that. Build that base. Tie right. your organization, other organizations can grow, right? Because they, the number, there's number, there's power in numbers, right? And the more numbers, the more people you get involved and engaged in. The more power you have, the voice will become louder, right? Uh, use social media. I don't know. Well, I write for those who post. Okay. I mean, I'm coming on my wrist tomorrow. I've been writing for like eight years. Okay, great. Before I even came home. Great. I, I had a guy write for a bedroom before that. Okay. You know, this is like maybe 20 years ago. Um, I tried to never, never, never before. You know, I have a friend of Colin in those books. Right. You know, uh, I don't know who's doing, who's doing the phone right now. 
Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. And first of all, I just want to say it's an honor to see you here after all the years that you did behind those tombstones, solitary confinement, general population. So I was one of the younger uh, organizers when the New Africans that he was talking about. Solitary confinement was plenty to some of the people, white supremacists that kept these brothers in there for decades with the worldview. When he, they got these books from George Jackson and them, Solidarity Brothers, they were putting the solitary front for just their worldview, not because of a crime. So these elders are still incarcerated, so this is why we gotta liberate our elders. I just want to stipulate some of the focal points for our five core demands to liberate our elders. Anybody over the age of 50 should be considered for expedited release immediately. Anybody that <laughs> Anybody that has suffered an ailment that could lead to their death should be considered for expedited release immediately. Anybody who has been incarcerated for 25 years or more should be considered for expedited release immediately. Anybody subjected to indefinite punishment based on violation rule reports, which are currently being treated as felonies by the parole board, those who have suffered the consequences of double jeopardy should be considered for expedited release immediately. And last of all, not, but not last but not least, in civil death by an indeterminate sentence. When you talk about George Jackson, he had one in life in the indeterminate sentence. So you got brothers like Satawa, Abdul Shakur. These are California political prisoners. And y'all can look on social media, you can look in the Bayview. California prison folk has been around for 35 years. And we still, I'm now the director of California Prison Focus. I just did 18 years in Pelican Bay and six years in the feds. I tell that story through the culture and arts. And this is one of our elders. When I look at this book, Liberate Our Elders, I'm strategizing. So when he talked about building cadre study groups, this is what we was doing inside and we created a parallel society. The agreement to end hostility is now inside the schools. I got a fourth module where I'm teaching this curriculum. So thank you for your time. Thank you for showing up. Thank you, Brother Ross. Thank you, Brother Ross. Well, how can people get in contact with you and support what you're doing? You can go on prisons.org. That's prisons, plural. Prisons.org slash action. Or you can just Google Minister King Gates. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you for having me. And um, my question is so I think of a lot of my friends who I'm trying to focus on, I'm trying to get to the people, I'm trying to get them to become more involved, but I have a lot of friends who are just like, just stay home. And um, I was going to ask you, I guess my question is in two parts. One, how did you keep your mind free all those years of being conditioned and being tortured and being kind of trying to uh, destroy your mind? How were you able to keep your mind free? How were you able to liberate those who had been conditioned to accept their position in society? First question. The first answer to the first question is that it was hard. I admit that. This was on. I became, I was determined to come out of prison. I had a life sentence. And I told myself, I'm going to die in prison. Period. That's not going to happen. That's one thing. So, anyway, I had a goal to achieve while I was in prison. One of those, get back to the streets so I can have some time with my kid. Right? My kid was in the womb when I went to prison, right? Uh, just for posterity's sake, you know what I'm saying? Just for, on August 21st, 1971, Comrade George was murdered. On August 28th, the following week, I went to retaliate against his being murdered. And my machine gun jammed, right? 
they're kind of like a capsule. And then they piled all kinds of stuff on top of that. Okay. When I was in prison, I knew it was going to be there for a long time. I knew that. Right? But I also knew they ain't going to keep me there for life. Okay. And so I continued to contribute to the movement even while I was inside. By purpose. Right? I didn't let the time do me. I did the time. Don't let the time do you. So I don't have where that thing go. In other words, I stayed on top of my game while I was in prison. Okay? And figure out ways how I can contribute. That gave me purpose. That gave me a reason for me to stay alive and not go crazy. Now, let me add this point. Um, a case called San Francisco 8K. Right? That was held in uh, um, 850 Bryan Street for two years. Sounds like a confinement. Right? No windows. No sunshine. No clean air. Two years. Almost lost it. I had to sleep on the ground, sleep on the floor in order to get some fresh air at one point in time. Almost lost it. I had to find, I had to go down deep, deep, I had to find my sanity. Stay home, stay strong. Right? But yeah, there's others in there. And, and that and this place where they hold me at it was called the dungeon. In the law book, it's called the dungeon. Two years. No sunshine, no fresh air, right? And in an area of five cells and a shower with two TVs blasted all day long. Nobody was bringing in there was individuals who were detoxing or something some kind of schizophrenic or something in the population. And the only reason why they held me there was the only reason why. Right? Two years ago. Torture. Torture. Right? I managed. Get out of that or some degree of sanity, some degree of sanity, some degree of sanity, some degree of sanity right? Yeah. Uh, you got to have, the, you have, you have the, the internal fortitude, the internal fortitude, and have purpose, right? And you get through. Right? Our comrades we talked about was in the uh, 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 Pelican Bay doing a hunger strike, right? Surviving that, yo, it's torture, right? 20 years of solitary confinement. Torture. Yeah, that's what they do. That's, what they do. that's the system. They engage in torture. Go Google, go Google, uh, uh, go to YouTube and, and look up legacy of torture. Right? The deal with San Francisco 8 case. Where they tried, when they did, in fact, torture some of my comrades, try to make them turn. They failed, except for one. Right? And that's a whole other story, and I don't want to get into that, but yeah, that's what they do. You gotta have the internal fortitude, the discipline. We talked about earlier about discipline. You gotta have the mindset that you know what your purpose is. Purpose is, I'm a revolutionary, and you're breaking it, period. That's the mindset, that's the discipline, that's the arrogance that you have, right? And the belief that you have that you're gonna be about something substantial. Your life will have meaning. Your life is going to have meaning. Right? If you have that, you move forward no matter what. And we as a people, 400 years, come on, man, this is strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are. Yeah? Even though they try to deny us our own humanity. We manage. We manage. We continue to push on. We need to unite in terms of our identity. We don't have identity yet as being new Africans. Right? That's the next step. That's the next step. When we get that, we are free people. We are free the world. What was the second question? It was two part question. What was the second part? The second one was how did you apply those to souls that depressed the torture and conditioning you went from? Teach them. You only teach those who want to learn. Right? You only teach those who want to learn. If they have the capacity, if they have, if they have a question, have an answer for them. All right? But that means what? You got to learn. All right? At one time, I had 500 books in the cell. I used to hate them in my cell, search my cell. Maybe in two or three hours, tear my cell apart. Take another two or three hours to put it back together again. And I had 500 books at one time in the cell. 
Still, racism. We have racism. Right? That's why I say we write this book. I got another book out too. On Escape the Prison Faith of Black. Essays and Poems. Right? And so, uh, being able to write, discuss the issue with people, write about it. We really go into you know, what is your contribution? What can you, what, do you have something to say? Do you have something to say? Get it out there and say it. Right? Because you have something to say, it was somebody want to hear it. So it's only here, right? So for me, it was those individuals who wanted to learn something, and if I had the pass, the pass to give them the answer, I would do so. And I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. Let's go Google it. <laughs> or let's go find out. Let's go do some research, right? I have a problem saying, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. Right? But what I do know, I'm going to tell you. Right? There's something you do have to say, that's going to reject it. We got to teach, bro. Each one, each one. Okay. Thank you. How many more questions do you want to do? Uh, how many more are there? Four. Two, three. All right, let's do that. Four. Four. Five. Five questions and we're done. <laughs> All right, I got it. Five. <laughs> So I, um, I really like little to moments like this. I have a role in this environment where my parents encouraged me to embrace my blackness and then learn about my ancestry. Uh, I've been doing a lot of learning, um, but this stuff is so petty. And when you look at it, right there. What is petty? Just this stuff is so petty. Yeah. 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 Oh, heavy, okay, heavy. It's heavy. Okay. It's heavy. And even like, you know, when you look at or read stories about, you know, the ones who came before us who was part of the movement and stuff like that, it's so easy to absorb a lot of vicarious trauma. And I just want to add, like, I don't know what you can say to speak to, you know, like just self care, taking care of your mind, and, you know, like building up your reserves so that. You know, when it is ready, we will be ready to go. But it's just, it's a lot. And I feel like it is due to, um, well, I'm not going to say it's not necessarily for everybody, but like I said, it's, it's just very heavy. I would love to hear what you have to say as far as like, what you do then, as far as self care. Okay. Um, that, that's an excellent question, too. Uh, the idea of self care in this, Context, right? It's not to give up, right? To believe that you are capable of growing and developing continuously, right? That's self care. We as a people are traumatized. To, extent, to, to a large degree, we have normalized our trauma, right? The way that we're living today, we think it's okay. And it's not okay, right? It's not okay to be a second class citizen. It's not okay that when we have to give our children the talk. Why do we gotta give our kids the talk? Why we have to why we gotta tell our kids this is what you gotta do, we do this here, blah 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 blah. Why kids ain't gotta get take the talk? We understand our trauma, right? And we try to protect ourselves and not understand that trauma. Right? Yes, we need to heal ourselves. How do we heal ourselves? How? Right? Fighting back. Right? By being liberatory. Okay? Read France for not. Right? Wretched of the earth. Right? Dying colonialism. Black skin, white mask. White, black skin, white mask. Read that. Study those. Right? Because he gives us a formula to heal ourselves through the process of freeing ourselves. Right? You know what I just said? To heal ourselves through the process of freeing ourselves. We cannot heal ourselves if we continue to model ourselves to be oppressed. Right? That's the first thing. Knowing that you're oppressed and how kind of what trauma that is bringing to you, what injury and harm is bringing to you. Right? And then when we begin the process of decolonizing our minds, from ourselves, we begin the process of healing ourselves. Right? We're not no longer being uh, taken uh, that mess, you know. 
uh, as if it's normalizing our own oppression. So that's part of the process. Yes, uh, read the book, uh, uh, The War Before, a sister to few Bukhari. was my comment when we started the Jericho movement, The War Before. She talks explicitly about the process of healing ourselves, that revolution didn't have the time to do some healing, self-healing, All right? Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> find that place, that sanctuary, create a sanctuary where you can go to right? and do some rediscovering of yourself, your strength and your weaknesses. Rediscovering yourself and then get back engaged in the struggle again. Right? The struggle heals. The struggle heals. Right? To not struggle is to be complicit in your oppression. Uh, hello, thank you for talking to us. This has been amazing. Uh, one of my my question is um, about your your uh, three points that you brought up earlier, uh, your three principles, and your second one on that liberalism. Yes. My question is um, if you can give us a really good definition of what liberalism is, how it uh, affects us as a people, as people of color, as black people, how does it, um, how does liberalism intrude into our society? Um, because obviously it does. And, and uh, my, my last question is, is liberalism with capitalism itself is is it is there a possibility of some type of using of liberalism with socialism? I'm not saying I think, but I'm just saying uh, <laughs> All right, let me let me let me let me as succinctly as I possibly can answer the question of liberalism. Liberal, yeah. Liberalism liberalism is, is go along to get along. Go along, you know something that's not right. And you go along just because you don't want to be that person who create problems. That's liberalism, right? When you know that there's an issue that needs to be addressed and you don't address it, that's liberalism, right? Liberalism, when you know that you're doing something wrong and you don't correct yourself, that's liberalism, all right? Liberalism is when you fail to deal with the issues of contradictions. When you fail to issue contradictions, that's being liberal. Liberalism, right? As if you give the person a pass. I give you a pass because you're my buddy, you're my friend, you're my lady. Right? That's liberalism. Right? And what ultimately does, you reinforces that wrongdoing that person is doing. But you're not addressing it. Understand what I'm saying? So we cannot allow ourselves to be liberal because the liberalism weakens us and weakens our movement. So we just go along and get along. Sometimes you got to be the bad guy or the bad woman a bad day, right? Whatever your pronoun may be, okay? Sometimes you got to be that bad person, right? But you do it with love. Do it with the idea that you were giving your person or yourself a present. A gift to grow and develop and become a better person. Right? Failing to do that is liberalism. But I suggest for an even more uh, poignant, more defined, let me read combat liberalism by Mao Zedong. Right? Read that. I'll give you all the explanations you need. Combat liberalism by Mao Zedong. Question. Peace. Peace. Thank you for speaking. Thanks for the People's Program for doing the work on the ground. So I had a question about um, the study groups and the book clubs and whatnot. You were talking about to help folks organize. I was wondering if there's just a few books that you could suggest that could like get folks fundamentally, you know, engaged and maybe have some help them with a political analysis. Just a few simple books, maybe, please. A few simple books. <laughs> Where do you want me to begin? Uh, Mao Zedong, uh, uh, 
right? Baseball and you know that one, and the brother asked for a book, get the book, this is the case of the big book by Carl G. Wilson, right? That's a fact, right? And thirdly, right, we want to make sure that the school budget, money that schools have, is used in accordance to the needs of our students. I'm going to go fourth thing, right? We need to get sociologists and psychologists in these schools, black sociologists and psychologists, like black kids with trauma ties, right? They go to school trauma ties, right? And we need to have, our schools should be, our schools in our, in our communities, in better communities should be a village for our babies. Right? She said every resource that like kids need should be in the buildings. But that means we have control of the schools. Right? We need to fight for control of this public school, our community. They should become community schools. We we'll call public schools, maybe community schools. Right? And if we do that, we change the trajectory. We change the, the, the dynamic. The, we change the paradigm. It's the model of how we teach our babies. Right? So public schools, could be better, should be better, but only if the community is engaged with the public schools. Thank you, parents, guardians of these kids, right? You have to be more involved, more engaged. I just hate my mom coming to school to say about what's wrong with me, right? I hate it, and she's gone. Right? But she's coming out and cuss me up because the teacher out there. That's how she wants, right? Yeah, that's how we have to, have to be proactive. And not react. All right? The race schools, you build them up, bro. You start off with uh, home teaching, and we go from there. Any more questions? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I didn't go so into my question. I have a question. How do you recommend that we balance the fact that we're in a state of emergency and that developing that group thing that you talk about takes like a bit of time? Um, like even from an autonomous perspective that we as Muslims operate on a concept of time that's not necessarily of this world. Um, and yet still this like dunya worldly sense of time is something that's used to go against us. Do you have any recommendations on that? Uh, yeah, that's that's saying a whole lot, sir. <laughs> as Muslims, we have a responsibility. <clears throat> and I don't want to get too deep and too heavy on it. I lost one of the other said that Muslims put in the best chance of the planet. Five years on the earth. Right? We have a responsibility, we have a duty by our Lord to take care of this planet. That's our responsibility as Muslims. Right? Five chairs on the planet. Right? It's in the book, it states that. Right? So that means that anything that we see going on, we should correct it. Right? We put it on the throttle. Right? If we can. Right? Allah also tells that. He judges it by our niya, our intent. So we have to have the intention to do the right thing. Right? To do the right thing. Right? And unfortunately for us, I'm not saying for all of us, but for many Muslims, right, they find themselves divorcing from the material world, concentrating on the spiritual world. Right? They just want to make sure they get to the gender, right? Get to paradise, get to heaven, right? By insula insulating themselves. And that's the reason why Muslims are always attacked, right? Always being confined, being being curtailed, right? Contained in their those and Um Let me add, let me add something else on a bigger a bigger world view. There's three world views in, in in power power views on the planet, right? Capitalist imperialism, socialist communism. And Islam, right? Judaism, Christianity is hooked up with uh, 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 Judaism, uh, Judaism, Christianity is hooked up with capitalism. And each one of these belief systems has a desire to be the major ideological, political, economic, social foundation of the planet. Right? That's what the wars we got going on in the planet today. Based on these three world views. All right, so <clears throat> we have to figure out some kind of way how to develop those ideas and world views that become universal. So we will take the universal ideas, the universal moral ethics, and ethical principles that are good for each and combine them and make them operate for all. Okay. 
That's a duty of the Muslim. And that's one of another brother asking me how to survive prison. I'm a Muslim. I have an obligation to my Lord to do this work. Obligated. Right? Now, I'm not saying I'm the best Muslim in the world. Mm -hmm. Far from it. Right? That's my Muslim criticism. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's my reality. You know what I'm saying? So, as a Muslim and as a revolutionary, as a new African, right? First of all, make sure you understand what your place is on this planet, right? Even if you're just a mother, teach the babies to be better, right? If you're a teacher, teach their classroom. If you're just a worker, right? Join the union, right? Find the methods and means for which you can engage in struggle wherever you are. The system that we now engage right now it is corrupt to its core. It has been from its, from its initial beginning. It has been engaged in nihilistic savagery, barbarism. That's what happens with it. Savagery and barbarism. Tell them what it is. If you see the, the amount of death that has been perpetrated as this system of capitalist imperialism, if we look at it, it's bloodthirst. It's terrible. You know, it's terrible. So yes, there has to be a correction. We have to do a, a correction, right? Uh, in terms of our understanding our own common humanity, our universal humanity. Right? We are people on this planet. Right? We are species on this another species on this planet. Right? And we have an obligation to protect the planet. And we take the planet to protect the people of the planet. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. All right, but yeah, there are three worldviews in the world. The three major worldviews on the planet, right? And we got to figure out a way how to, how to integrate them, to find out the best parts of each, and cobble them together so they be the ones that we live by. That we govern by. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm about to close out. I was going to say, um, if you didn't get a question answered tonight, I suggest you read his book because it's all in you. Um, also, listen to the five Hello Black podcast episodes he didn't been on because uh, this is all there. And I just want to say, he spoke a lot about um, commitment, about will, and about healing. And at People's Programs, that's what we're trying to do. All the things that he's speaking, we're trying to bring it to life through our decolonization programs. And so all the teachers in this book come to life through our programs. Um, and so you don't even gotta go out and get creative. You ain't gotta go out and get creative. You ain't gotta think too much. You can just pull up next door and come organize and work with us. All it takes is an hour a day, an hour a week um, to get some of that healing, to test your will, uh, to be determined. Um, and I just wanna thank Jaleel for, for being here today. Y'all know he flew in this morning and pulled up. Uh, and came and spoke in front of y'all for three hours. And so this is not a testament to what's possible through determination, through will, through commitment, 50 years behind bars and to be here in front of us. I'm just honored. Let me say something. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, 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 stop. You are supposed to be honored for being here. Look at all those who are not here. You've made that commitment to be here. Right? Honor yourself having that kind of commitment and that kind of determination. Take the time out of your life, come here, listen to this old man talk about some stuff. <laughs> All right. So, Will is one of the most humble people I know, as y'all can see. But <laughs> it's very important we give him his flowers and uh, thank you, you know, for the sacrifice you made. Come on, let go. Bye, sir.